Okay, <laughs> um, so today I want to talk to you about um, some work we just finished up. Um, and it's a survey for variability on low mass objects and exoplanet analogues. Um, and I was helped massively by my small army of collaborators, so special thanks to them. Um, so first a bit of background. Um, almost as soon as we detected brown dwarves, it became clear that there was some sort of atmospheric features such as patchy clouds in their atmospheres. And combined with their fairly rapid rotation, this would produce photometric variability, or this, these modulations in the light curve as these patches of clouds rotated in and out of view. Um, and searches for photometric variability began straight away, really, but it took pretty much a decade before we detected the first highly significant periodic um, detection in this T dwarf SIMP0136. And as you can see, the light curve evolves pretty rapidly from night to night, but it's consistently variable, and you can always um, see the same period, which is the rotation period of the object. Um, and since this initial detection, several surveys have been carried out. Um, on the right, I'm showing Jackie Radigan's survey. This was one of the first large infrared surveys for variability in LNT type brown dwarfs. And well, firstly, this survey found that variability is quite common among LNT type brown dwarfs. Um, also, they noticed this increase in variability amplitude and frequency at the LT transition. So objects in that LT transition are more likely to be variable than the early Ls or the T dwarfs. Um, then on the, the left hand, or the right hand side, <laughs> I'm showing um, results from a survey by Stan Metchev, um, which is a Spitzer survey. Um, with hi much higher precision from space, they were sensitive to much lower variability amplitudes. And this survey found that virtually all brown dwarves are variable um, uh, if you have the precision um, and if you, um, if you correct for inclination effects. Um, Interestingly, the survey also found a tentative correlation between low gravity and high amplitude variability in their small sample of low gravity objects. Um, so now, thanks to several moving group membership tools and the development of um, low gravity spectral indicators, we have this new um, a sizable sample of low gravity brown dwarfs. And when you plot them alongside the field brown dwarf population, as we learned in earlier talks, they look quite different. So the field brown dwarf population is shown uh, by the gray points, and then the low gravity objects are shown in orange, with objects that are members of young moving groups are shown by the stars. And you can see that it's all shifted to the right hand side of the color magnitude diagram. They exhibit much redder colors, um, and they also extend down to much lower magnitudes um, than the field brown dwarf population. Um, and this is thought to be due to their low gravity. Um, so we think that there are thicker clouds um, in these low gravity objects, and the clouds seem to stick around to much lower temperatures um, than we see for the T dwarfs. Um, and if we plot a couple of the directly imaged planets and young companions over that, we see that um, these objects share a remarkable resemblance with the low gravity objects. So by studying these easy to observe, um, free floating planetary mass objects, we can learn a lot about the directly imaged planets. Um, and there have been a couple of detections of variability in low gravity objects already. Um, the first one on, on the right hand side, or the left hand side, is PSO318. And this is the first planetary mass variable detected. Um, and we actually detected it as part of the, sur the survey that I'm about to discuss. Um, so this is an, a late L, L7.5, about eight Jupiter mass object. Um, its amplitude is about 10%, so it varied by 10% over five hours, um, which was the highest variability amplitude detected to date in an L type object. Um, this was swiftly followed by two HST detections, one in the companion to them, 1207b, and then one in the intermediate mass object, W0047. And in particular, the very high amplitude seen for PSO318 and W0047 um, kind of suggested that we might be seeing different variability properties for the low gravity objects. Um, and this is reasonable to expect because we think the cloud properties are different, so therefore, variability caused by clouds could be different. 
Um, okay, so this brings me to our survey. Um, so this is a ground-based J-band survey for photometric variability. Um, we're using the NTT and Euchre telescopes. Um, and our survey is made up of 30 objects that are high likelihood members of young moving groups and objects that show signs of low gravity in their spectra. Um, we observed each object for as long as possible. However, due to air mass and weather constraints, most light curves are limited to about three to five hours. Um, and this is just the object was measured parallaxes on a color magnitude diagram. And you can see that again, they're kind of shifted to the right of the field brown dwarf population. Um, okay, so uh, it can be quite tricky to get light curves out of the raw data um, because raw light curves vary and they show these modulations due to changes in air mass, seeing, and instrumental effects. Um, and, but to a pretty good approximation, we can correct for all of this using reference stars. So we use a minimum of three reference stars to correct each light curve, and we use the reference stars to create a calibration curve that we can then divide um, our target light curve by. And for this part of the analysis, we actually had two independent reductions, um, one carried out by myself and one carried out by Simon Erickson, who's a PhD student in Stockholm. Um, and both independent reductions produced very similar light curves, um, so that was good. Um, so once we have a set of well-behaved, flat reference stars, we can use periodogram analysis to check the significance of any trends that we see in the data. Um, so here I'm showing our periodogram analysis. The top is just the light curve again. And the middle panel shows the Lomsgargel periodogram of the target, shown in black, the reference stars in gray, and the 1 and 5% false alarm probability rates um, as the blue dashed lines. Um, so you can see PSO318 is a very highly significant variable. Um, and then for each observa observation as well, we can construct the sensitivity plot, which I'm showing on the bottom panel. Um, so this is the probability of detecting um, variability with given amplitudes and periods, given our um, observation given the quality of the data, basically. So you probably can't see the contours, but the white region corresponds to amplitudes and periods we would detect 50% of the time, and the blue shows higher detection probabilities, and the red shows lower. Um, and that'll come in handy a bit later on. Um, so in total in the survey, we detected variability in seven objects, um, six of which are L dwarves, and they're shown by the light blue. Um, and we can see in this population the large one is PSO318, which is really not shocking. Um, so we can see that the amplitude kind of seems to increase as you um, cool with spectral type in the L sequence. Um, we additionally detected variability in a T dwarf object. Um, however, its youth was a bit more uncertain than the L dwarves, so we'll have to follow up that object to confirm its youth. Um, now, the main aim of this survey was to compare it to Jackie Radigan's um, survey of field brown dwarfs. Um, but when you plot them side by side, it's fairly obvious that we, we are completely lacking in T dwarves um, because there are very few young known T dwarves um, that are bright enough for these ground based observations. Um, so to get around that, we're just focusing on the L0 to L8.5 objects in both surveys. And um, they both have very similar sample sizes um, for more robust analysis. Okay, so when you compare the two surveys, um, the initial survey found two variable objects out of 34 in the high gravity case. Um, our survey found six um, variable low gravity objects out of a sample size of 27. Um, so to calculate the variability occurrence rate for both samples, we use the QMAS code written by Mariangela Bonavita. And this is a Bayesian statistical analysis framework that was actually developed for direct imaging surveys. Um, so we modified it a little bit, um, and the code takes each sensitivity plot for every single observation. We put in the number of detections and the full sample size um, to produce a distribution of the variability occurrence rates. So um, again, the left-hand side shows the high-gravity field brown dwarf um, survey, and the right-hand side 
side shows uh, the low gravity case. Um, and you can see that the peak of the probability distributions lie in different areas. The high gravity objects have a lower variability occurrence rates than the low gravity objects. Um, so the low gravity objects seem to be more likely variable than the field brain dwarf case. Um, and I'll quickly just talk about some follow-up we also did as part of the survey. Um, we went on to get three consecutive nights of observations of PSO 318, um, which was our first detection of the survey. Um, the orange dots show the, the J-band and the greens show the K-band. Um, there's a few things to notice. The, so the J-band amplitude was, n was nowhere near as high as our first epic detection. And then it's even seemed to decrease over the course of three nights. So this variable does evolve over time um, significantly. Um, also, the, we measured the amplitude of the ratios between the J and K band amplitudes. Um, and this was consistent with field brown dwarf ratios. So it possibly um, suggests that the, there's a similar variability mechanism causing um, what we see. Um, again, uh, we also see that the J and K band um, light curves are in phase with each other. And this suggests that the J and K band are probing a similar atmospheric height. Uh, we also use these observations to measure the rotational period of PSO 318. Um, if we assume a sinusoid, we get a period of about 8.5 hours. Um, and this is fairly fast for a young object. Um, and it's quite similar to solar system um, rotational periods. Um, and just to point out, if you want even more follow-up observations of PSO 318, we obtained simultaneous HST and Spitzer observations. Um, they show these dramatic phase shifts, so the crosses are the mid-infrared um, uh, observation light curve, and then the HST are the colored dots. Um, and yeah, if you want to learn more about that, you can either look at poster 2024, 20, which is Beth's poster, but she may have taken it down already. And if not, you can look at Beth's bill, uh, our paper, which is on the archive. Um, OK, and my conclusions. So we've conducted the first large survey for photometric variability on low gravity objects. Um, we've detected variability in six low gravity objects um, and one possibly low gravity object. And these are prime targets for follow-up studies. Um, and I will be obtaining Spitzer time series and monitoring of the detections in this survey. Um, and the survey results show that the variability occurrence rate among the low gravity objects is higher than that of the field brown dwarf object. And I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Nice talk. Um, questions? All right. Oh, yeah, there is one over there in the back. <laughs> Hi, uh, great talk. This is Rene Heller from the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Germany. Have you tried looking for transiting objects in the light curves of these um, substellar? We, we, haven't, we haven't looked for them, but we haven't noticed them either. Um, I should check what what um, what kind or what size of object we could find given our uh, photometric noise, but I haven't searched for them. No. Okay. Next question here. I can just shout. Um, given the previous, uh, given the, the, the previous talk on the, the uh, models of cloud structures, would you care to speculate? I'm assuming you were paying attention to that one. Would you care to speculate <laughs> on uh, what your results are saying about that? Is it that you know that, that these clouds are higher up in these lower gravity objects and more easily broken up, or go wild? If, um, if I had to speculate, I would say that because the clouds are forming higher up, maybe the the there's a bigger temperature difference between the two layers of clouds that we're seeing, and maybe that is causing a higher amplitude. But I think more observations, like our simultaneous observations of PSO 318, will be needed to actually figure out why we're getting these high amplitudes. Yeah, it would be great to have spectroscopy and photometry combined. Yes, yeah. that would be great. All right, more questions here? 
If not, uh, let's thank uh, Johan again. Thanks. And we.